<laughs> the next point is uh, the central governor. Sure. I mean, how do you approach an all complex organ yeah. such as like the brain? Uh, and where do you see the major handicaps in investigating mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. an organ? I think it was excluded from research for, yeah. I, especially in, in yeah. sports, for so many decades yeah. or centuries yeah. or whatsoever. How do you manage this and how you tackle this? Yeah. Let me just explain also why we got interested. Because when we started the sports science course at the University of Cape Town in 1981, it was exactly the same year that the other event happened. We had very little equipment. We had the most archaic, basic equipment. And of course, if you're an exercise scientist, you have to measure oxygen consumption. So we went out and measured oxygen consumption, eventually got the equipment to measure oxygen consumption. And then we were told that when you exercise someone to exhaustion, their oxygen consumption is meant to rise and then reach a plateau. And so although they run faster, their oxygen consumption does not continue to rise. And we couldn't find it. So this phenomenon. And then at that time, if you wanted to publish something on VO2 max, you had to say, in 100% of patients, I show the plateau phenomenon. So I said, but we didn't, so we can't write that. And then I began to question. How, why are these people stopping exercise if they don't show the plateau? And the question then became, well, it can't be due to oxygen failure because they're still consuming more oxygen. So then eventually, eventually, I, I understood how the brain worked, but it took till 2000, till, no, sorry, till 1997, 1998, till I suddenly realized how the brain was in control. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that it was muscle recruitment because at that time, I trained with Professor O.P. and I understood when the heart contracts, the contractility, contractility can be regulated by different chemical processes. But of course there's 100% recruitment every time. And I didn't understand, neither did any exercise physiologist who was writing at that time, that you don't get 100% recruitment in your skeletal muscles during exercise. The assumption was that when you're exhausted, you're recruiting 100%. And so when we started studying it, that was the first question we looked at. And we found that there's never 100% muscle recruitment, yeah. so then that proves the brain's in charge. Yeah. Yeah. And people have struggled to get that. But it, it's really interesting because today, when I wrote the, probably the most important paper was the paper that I presented the J.B. Wolf lecture in 1996, published in 97. And then that was called Challenging Beliefs, Out of Africa, Always Something New. And that was the first one where I said the brain regulates performance. And of course, people were absolutely astonished that a scientist could say that because they knew it was wrong. And people forget that at that time, no one thought the brain regulated exercise performance. And that was 96. Today, what they say is, of course we know the brain controls exercise performance, but it's not the way Noakes describes it. It's not the central government. So to, to the the problem at the moment is that, so, so the next thing was that we did pacing studies and as soon as you pace, then you see the brains in charge. And we were, I think we were one of the first to look at heart rates during people cycling because the technology had just come out in the late 1990s. And we suddenly found that cyclists don't cycle at the same heart rate when they're out in competition. The heart rate's going up and down and it was clearly showing pacing. And at the same time, we were able to buy the first bicycles for laboratory studies where you could put your own bicycle on them so that we could measure the pacing. And they were pretty rudimentary. But then that, and then they become much better today. But that allowed us to do the very first pacing studies. And they just showed that when people pace themselves, they speed up at the end, for example. And that tells you that fatigue is not what we think it is. That there's a complete discrepancy because when you're feeling the most tired, you actually perform your best. So that was the paradox. And then we started to explain that. And then we came up with a theory that fatigue is purely an emotion, which your brain uses to regulate your performance. Yeah, yeah. So that was easy to show. So the, the pacing was easy to show. And the fact that, that fatigue is an emotion was easy to show. Was also, the next thing that came up was that the rating of perceived exertion rises as a, as a linear function of the exercise duration or the percentage of the duration of the exercise. And that was amazingly, well it wasn't, it actually had been reported in 1978, but it got completely forgotten, so we rediscovered it. So then we knew that the sensations of fatigue are related to how close you are to the finish of the race. 
-hmm. and they have absolutely nothing to do with your physical state. Mm -hmm. So that was the next breakthrough. And I think that's, we're now trying to look at parts of the brain that are active during exercise and which parts of the brain become active when you make a decision mm -hmm. to slow down or to speed up or when you become, the brain becomes hypoxic, what areas of the brain are telling you to slow down? So we, we are doing those studies, they're, they're complex because you can't allow any movement of the brain in the fMRI which we use. Um, and in fact, we have our first draft of our first paper where we have some athletes where we manage to get the brain to be absolutely stable uh, during the exercise. And so we do have some preliminary data on areas of the brain that become active. Of course, I mean, the, the central government is discussed a lot and I don't know how it is, is it now generally accepted or is it more neglected or how do you feel about it now? Oh, some, yeah, um, absolutely. Seven, it's much more accepted. Yeah. We, again, I, the first time I used the central government name was, I think, 1998. And then people just laughed at it. They literally did. They said, you know, you've lost your mind. That if you look at the old textbooks of exercise physiology in the early 1900s, yeah. motor control was the first chapter. And everyone studied motor control because we didn't know anything about the cardiovascular system. But then what happened was Mount Everest came along. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, if you wanted to be a great exercise physiologist, you had to study cardiovascular function or respiratory function. And these were the first people who catheterized the heart. So in the 1960s, you had these people who were measuring cardiac outputs. And so they became the dominant force. Mm -hmm. And they were very powerful. So that the, particularly the American Physiological Society became dominated by cardiovascular and respiratory physiologists. And they were driving their agenda, which was that the heart and the lungs control exercise mm -hmm. performance. And their careers depended on it, because the funding from the NIH was coming for them. It's similar to the yeah. Human Genome Project, all the exactly. money went. Exactly. exactly. And what happened is the neuroscientists withdrew from the exercise sciences. Uh -huh. So okay. there were a lot of people who were continuing to do research, but they just withdrew. And so if you went to the major, major meetings on exercise science you know, in America or Europe, it was dominated by the cardiovascular physiologists and the neuroscientists just didn't appear. Okay. They continued. <clears throat> and what the central governor model has managed to do is to bring back the neuroscientists back into exercise science and exercise physiology. And so those people, they said, well, of course, we always knew and we've been studying it for 40 years. So what are you telling us? So, the, the, and they, so there was no problem with them, but the, the exercise scientists, some of them have, dra have changed from respiratory and cardiovascular physiology into the brain. So they've made that adaptation as well, and they now will drive it in the future.